Thank y'all for those of you who came. This, I say we we'll go ahead and, and get started with, with the presentation. Paul, you ready? Okay. All right. Uh, here we go. So this is kind of the overview of, of what we're going to talk about today. Um, obviously, looking at the 3.0 standard um, and, and review of the, the technology behind that. Um, and then kind of go over some of the advantages and disadvantages. A lot of these that we put together are, are for the consumer. Obviously, there's, there's quite a bit of advantages and disadvantages for broadcasters as well. Um, and so again, open to discussion if there's something that we left out that you think is important for anyone in this meeting to know. Um, great time for, for you to share that. So, all right. Paul? It's my turn. All you. Okay. Your turn. All right. So for, for those of you that don't know, uh, the ATSC 3.0 is a new over-the-air broadcast television standard. Um, it uh, will probably eventually replace the uh, current ATSC 1.0 um, that we're using now. Um, it has um, a whole bunch of new features um, that, um, that make it um, pretty appealing. Um, so the, um, the transmission of the audio and video is, is sent over IP protocol um, kind of data packaging as opposed to just the MPEG transport stream that we use um, currently with the ATSC 1.0. Um, it's also designed um, to work together, I guess, bring together over the air and over the top content. Um, and so we'll get over, go over that a little bit later when we talk about interactivity. Um, it has... Um, the ability to um, transmit much higher video quality and uh, up to 10.1 uh, Dolby Atmos audio, or I think there's a DTS standard that's included in there too. Um, so you can have you know much more immersive audio. Um, there's also new features um, involving the emergency um, alerting. Um, because the, um, I guess, receiver can collect data on where you're at, uh, they can actually, uh, the broadcasters can send targeted uh, emergency alerts. Um, so it might be down by the zip code if it's like a, you know, tornado warning or something. Um, and um, another feature uh, is that they kind of designed the standard to be kind of open-ended um, as far as, you know, future advances in technology. So let's say later on down the road, um, a higher efficiency video codec is developed, well, it can fit in um, with the standard without, you know, having to rewrite the standard. So that's um, kind of another one of the, um, one of the goals they had when they were creating the standard. So um, right now uh, in the United States, it looks like this HEVC um, codec is going to be used. Um, although that's something that that's not really carved in stone in the standard. Um, and of course, the current ATSC 1.0 uses MPEG-2 uh, with the highest resolution um, is, is 1080i. Um, the HEVC codec that's allowed um, can do, um, you know, 4K. It, it supports the um, high dynamic range and wide color gamut, um, and it can support up to 120 hertz frame rate. Um, so there, there's a bunch of I guess a bunch of um, options available to the broadcasters. Um, it can also support very low resolution, um, you know, streams if if the broadcaster wants to go that route and have more more programs available at a lower resolution. Um, the audio is is um, in the U.S. is going to be the this AC4 uh, format, which supports up to 10.1 um, surround sound. Um, as opposed to the, the AC3 that we're using currently with the 1.0 that, that just supports uh, 5.1. Um, another feature um, is related to the captions. The captions are not just you know text characters that are that are sent out. They they can include uh, graphics and in you know different fonts, different colors, different styles, different languages. Um, so there's some more um, more um, option for variety, I guess, in the subtitles. Um, the service info um, is a little bit different than the ATSC 1.0, but it um, it uses uh, media presentation description as opposed to the 
PSIP, that's program specific information protocol, if I remember. <laughs> but um, it's just a way that um, the data about the programming is included in the stream. Um, and then uh, on delivery, of course, the ATSC 1.0 is just the MPEG transport stream um, that is really pretty much limited to audio and video and a very limited amount of data. Um, with the ATSC 3.0, we have um, two different uh, kind of standards that are available of kind of packaging the data. One of them is, is um, I want to pronounce it route. The, the seminar I watched called it root. I guess that depends on where you live. Um, or this MMT, uh, and the, the, the route um, pack, packet delivery is, is more suited for a combination of audio, video, and data. Uh, the MMT um, protocol is, is really more suited for just audio and video. So it looks like the, the route's probably going to be more common um, from the broadcasters just because it allows sending data. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk about the studio to transmitter link. So, so the way it is, the way this protocol works, uh, the broadcaster can send basically this, this data stream directly to the transmitter. It doesn't have to be modified or changed at the transmitter site. It just gets modulated and broadcast out. Um, and that's a, a little bit different with the, the MPEG. Um, and then we're going to talk about RF delivery here. So the, the modulation scheme that was chosen for the ATSC 3.0 is this OFDM. Um, as opposed to the 8 VSB um, in the current ATSC 1.0. Uh, the advantages of the OFDM um, are that it, it works really well in kind of non-optimal environments. So that can mean um, if you're in an environment where there might be multipath, you know, reflections from buildings or terrain. Um, and it also works well if, if you're moving, if, if you're not not stationary. If you're in a vehicle moving, um, that that um, modulation scheme works really well there. Um, and so, kind of the advantage is this kind of opens this up for um, being able to receive the ATSC 3.0 broadcasts on mobile devices, you know, phones and tablets. Um, so you could be sitting on your you know bus going to work in the morning, and you could be watching your your local news um, just over the air. So that's kind of one of their one of their goals. Um, so the OFDM, I guess I just kind of touched on that a little bit about, um, about its advantages. Um, another, um, I guess, feature is that it allows for these single frequency networks. And that basically what that is, that's multiple transmitter towers. Um, so you could have your main <clears throat> transmitter tower, um, but then you could have these kind of uh, additional transmitter towers, you know, to expand your coverage area. Um, and, and I, I kind of had a light bulb moment because, you know, I, I mentioned that the OFDM works well in dealing with multipath. Well, so the receiver, if it's in this single frequency network environment and it might be getting the signal from two different broadcast towers, well, it, it kind of appears the same as if it's a reflection from a building or something. So the, the receiver knows um, which signal to lock onto. Um, and so that that that's um, one of the other advantages. So so you can have, you know, the water coverage area, um, and and I guess another advantage is that it makes kind of the the receivers closer to an antenna. So let's say you're in a building, you know, let's say you're in an office building, and that in, that um, signal has to radiate, you know, through the walls. Well, you know, you'd be closer to a broadcast. Um, antenna as opposed to like here in Dallas, that would be 20 miles away from downtown. <laughs> um, so that's kind of one of the advantages. Um, another, uh, I guess, feature is that this, um, the transmission standard uses these physical layer pipes um, to transmit the audio, video, and the data. And, um, oh look, a graphic magically appeared. So as you can see in the little drawing, um, there's, there's actually four physical layer pipes in there. You have one that's the UHD service. And so um, the data in that pipe is kind of arranged with less error correction and higher bandwidth. And so um, people with like rooftop antennas would be able to pick that up no problem. And it might be a little harder for somebody to receive that if they're inside a building with, you know, maybe rabbit ear antenna or or maybe trying to view on a mobile device inside of a building. And so that, that 
physical layer pipe wouldn't really be available to them, uh, but they could receive this SD service, which would be on a, a separate physical layer pipe. And that, that would be uh, formatted with more air correction and less bandwidth. So it, it's a much more robust signal. Um, and then further on down, you have the mobile service and, and the data service. And th those would be even lower bit rate with higher air correction. Um, and so almost everybody would be able to receive those, whether you're in, you know, a bus driving down downtown or, you know, deep inside an office building, um, you know, that, that kind of environment. Um, and so I guess we'll talk about the audio and video layers. So it's, that's basically going to include the, the, the H264, um, the video compression, and then the, the AC4 audio. Now the standard allows for four, up to four AC4 audio streams. Um, so uh, I guess a kind of a use scenario there would be, let's say you're watching a football game and the broadcaster could, could transmit your local home team announcer commentators, or they could also, you know, transmit the announcers and commentators from the away team. And, and you as a viewer could pick which one you wanted to listen to. Um, and of course that would, you know, open the door for other languages or, you know, maybe um, audio enhanced for, or what is it? Um, video descriptive audio. There we go, where they describe the audio. Um, and, and part of this AC4, is uh, this feature called dialogue enhancement. So if, if you're maybe viewing in a less than optimal audio environment, um, there's, there's settings that where you can enhance the, 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 the dialogue so where you can understand it much better over the kind of the background noise. Um, and then there's also, it's kind of related user selectable audio uh, dynamic range compression. Um, so if you've got the, the home theater, with the 10.1 surround sound, you could select no dynamic range compression at all, and you'd get the full bandwidth, full you know, full audio. Um, but let's say you had a TV with just a sound bar, and you might want to select a little bit higher um, dynamic range compression to 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 get the dialogue to kind of pop out a little more. Um, and then kind of at the bottom end of the scale, if you're you know watching um, a program on a tablet, you would want a high level of the audio compression um, to, to make it, you know, I guess better to understand the, the dialogue. Um, and so I guess we're gonna move on to interactivity. Um, so this kind of relates to this kind of bridging of the over the air and the over the top content. Um, I think how I wanna describe this. Um, The, the option um, is there for, I guess, how do I want to describe this? There's, there can be like, like apps that are broadcast as part of the audio and video um, where the user can kind of interact with what's going on on the screen. Um, and some of, the, some of the data is, is you know, broadcast over the air, but if you have an internet connection, um, you can get kind of enhanced data um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I saw this um, little demonstration that was put together um, with CBS and they were broadcasting this cooking show. And um, down in the lower right corner of the screen was this little, they called it a bug. And you would use your, your uh, TV's remote, the up, down, left, right, and select buttons. And so you could select this little bug and using left or right, you could scroll through some options. So in this cooking show, they had a guest, the guest was gonna demonstrate a recipe that the guest was selling their cookbook. And so you could scroll through these little options that were available on this little bug and you could bring up a little bio of the guest. Uh, another option would bring up a, a printed you know, version of the recipe that they were gonna prepare. Um, and another option was, um, the, uh, the TV could actually send you a link to buy the cookbook. Um, so th this kind of works over um, the information you've entered in when you're setting up your TV. So it would send you a text message with a link um, to Amazon to buy the, the cookbook, for example. Um, there was another uh, option to share on Facebook. So if you wanted to share this segment with somebody on Facebook, then it would send that link um, to your phone and you could share it. Um, another kind of scenario, oh, also, uh, another option would be to view 
uh, other segments where other maybe other cooking segments or other video segments that had that same guest or related you know kind of content and that that content would be delivered to your tv through the through the you know the ethernet connection that wouldn't be delivered over the air but um but your link to that would come from the over the air um data that's in their their little app um I'm trying to think what to go to next i guess i can talk a little yeah. bit about um how um how this um interactivity could be used in uh, for maybe watching sports um some of the broadcasters seem kind of me this morning yeah some of the broadcasters seem kind of excited because right now in the united states there's 14 states that allow um allow wagering on on sporting games um and so it's conceivable that the broadcaster uh, could be broadcasting their their football game, and there could be links on on the screen, um, you know, using this interactivity that where you could could wager on the game. <laughs> so that's that's one of the potential options. Another option, I guess, would be for people that are into say fantasy football, um, where you could view uh, you could display data on your on your screen. You know, you, that you bring up with your remote again you know, using the inner and up, down, left, right. Um, and you could view maybe stats from uh, some players and some other games that are going on, you know, concurrently. Um, and so that, that's kind of one of the options. Uh, and I guess another option could also be uh, during a, like a sporting event, you could bring up maybe a camera angle from a different perspective. And again, that delivery or the, that content would be delivered you know, over the ethernet connection, but it would still be displayed, you know, on your screen, you know, along with the, the over the air content. Um, so that's kind of how they envision the interactivity to work. Um, but this is um, still kind of wide open that the kind of the, the programming for the interactivity, it's kind of built around HTML5. So, um, there's plenty of, uh, you, you know, the programmers don't have to learn new programming languages or anything because there, there's a lot of you know programmers out there now that that are competent um you know for for html5 and could could you know come up with content um so anyway that's i think that's about it i have that's all i've got on the interactivity okay um this is kind of the coverage map right now of atsc 3.0 um this is available on the ATSC.org website. They actually update it quite regularly. Um, and so we're lucky here in Dallas that we can kind of test with our own um, ATSC 3.0 broadcast because we are currently um, have, have that available to us. Um, but it is, it is spreading and spreading fast. Um, all right, advantages and disadvantages. Paul, I'll let you take this slide. Okay, please. well, so um, I guess we kind of covered some of these um, advantages earlier about the, the 4K with the high dynamic range and the wide color gamut and the high frame rate. Um, and of course, I mentioned um, we're currently going to use the H265 um, high efficiency video codec for video. Um, but again, that's flexible for, for in the future. Um, and there's potential to, to do 8K. I'm not sure. I, I know kind of a best case scenario, the bandwidth um, for kind of the, the least robust signal is about 25 megabits per second. And that's, uh, that's kind of equivalent to what you get if you're streaming uh, 4K content from somebody like, I know Disney Plus or whoever, whatever their premium service is. That's kind of about uh, the bandwidth that they use. So um, the potential's there. I guess if they can get a more efficient codec, they could probably squeeze out 8k <laughs> um, and then of course the reception again um, the, the broadcasters have the option of of having either more channels um, at kind of a lower uh, uh, resolution or they could have you know just a few channel one channel with 4k and then maybe another sd channel along with that um, or they could they could opt to do um, multiple, you know, just regular HD channels. I know right now the test in Dallas, um, they've got three HD channels and one SD channel um, on that one single RF channel. Um, 
And of course, uh, there's better coverage, uh, wider coverage area. Um, and of course, um, people at home that already have, you know, an antenna for their ATSC 1.0, they won't need to, to upgrade or change anything. Um, so that's, I guess, one of the advantages. Um, and of course, I mentioned with the um, the modulation scheme that that um, viewers with mobile devices will be able to, to watch TV, you know, as they're walking down the street or whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, so then it also has the capability for the advanced emergency alerts. And um, I guess I forgot to mention because of the because of the the broadcaster is going to know where you're at if you have the internet connection. They're going to be able to send you targeted advertising. So maybe they're going to, you know, target you with advertising for maybe restaurants in your specific, you know, area, or you know, some types of businesses that are that are in your area, um, or maybe based on your geography, they might target you with um, ads from certain retailers. Like I, don't know, I suppose if you live in Colorado, you might get, you know, ads for the for the outdoor stores. I don't know. <laughs> That's just a thought. <laughs> Um, so now the, the uh, disadvantage is, of course, it's not backwards compatible with ATSC 1.0. You're going to have to buy new equipment. Um, and I guess I'll mention this is kind of the chicken and egg thing. The broadcasters want to see more receivers out, you know, out in the wild before they um, kind of ramp up their programming. Um, so right now there's about 55 different models of televisions you can buy. They're mostly the kind of the high-end televisions. Uh, and they're from LG, uh, Samsung, and Sony right now. Um, and there's, I, I read there's a cell phone that's trying to come on the market by a company called One Media, and it's an Android cell phone, and it's got the chipset in it uh, to receive the ATC 3.0. Um, I haven't seen that it's actually available yet, but I, I know it's, it's on the way. And of course, Silicon Dust has their HD Home Run little box. It's basically a network interface. It, it has the tuner built in it um, and then an ethernet connection. And then you can view the content um, with uh, an app on your, on your smart TV um, is, is one way to go. Uh, they have an HD home run app for Roku. Um, and then I guess some of the, I guess app stores would have a, the HD home run app where you could view it on your, on your uh, smart TV. Um, so th there is hardware out there available. Um, and, and there's more and more coming every day. So, so that we'll eventually get over that, that hill. Um, so I guess one another disadvantage is the, is the geo-targeting. Maybe people are worried about their privacy, but I, I suppose there's a way around that because once you get it set up, you don't necessarily have to have the internet connection to, to view the over-the-air content. So there, there's kind of a way around that. Um, and so again, like it's not commonly available on um, on consumer TVs. You got to kind of seek them out. Um, so like the low end TVs aren't aren't going to have it. Your wall, you know, your two hundred dollar TV at Walmart is not going to going to have it. Um, so uh, that that's kind of one of the drawbacks. All right. Well, thanks, Paul, for going through that. Um, again, if there's any questions or um, requests anything this is kind of the time that will open up the floor um, for conversation discussion um, anything you think we missed um, bring it up now again you can put it in the chat window um, you can unmute yourself my light just went out because I'm not moving enough <laughs> um, so yeah we'll just open it up for for questions you can go okay here's one um, will the broadcasters be broadcasting concurrently in 1.0 and 3.0 for a time? Um, so, yeah, what I've read on that is if, if a broadcaster chooses to go to the 3.0, um, and I guess, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but it is voluntary among the broadcasters. So a broadcaster doesn't have to go to 3.0. It's not mandatory like um, when we um, changed over to the ATSC 1.0. Um, but once you start broadcasting in 3.0, um, you're allowed five years to, to simulcast your 1.0 content, and then you got to give that up. Um, and what we're kind of seeing is some um, some kind of sharing with broadcast spectrum from different um, broadcasters. Um, 
And I've, I've seen a test here in Dallas. Uh, there's one RF channel that's got ABC on it. And it has, um, I can't remember, it's one of the Spanish language um, broadcasters. Um, and so, so um, our ABC affiliate could technically give up their ATSC 1.0 and replace it with 3.0. And then their, their main ABC programming would still be available on that shared uh, channel. So yeah, five years is what I'm hearing. Thanks everybody um, for watching. Yeah, thank you all for coming for your time. Um, you know, we'll evaluate this. We might offer more events over more topics that will be similar. Um, but have a great rest of your day. Bye.